What we're going to do to break things up a little bit is we are going to start doing a news roundup where we talk about what's exciting us in the world of diecast to keep things active and current and give us a little bit of discussion topic to feast our mouths upon. Why did I say that? No. Wow. No. I would not have said it like that. You're watching Diecast Breakdown with Chuck Ellis. David Johns and Mark McHotwheel. So sit back, strap in, and hang on. The breakdown starts now. Hey there, folks. Chuck here, and welcome to Diecast Breakdown. We are so glad you're with us today. This is something a little bit different that we're going to be trying out. I'm really excited about this new format. And we're going to be just kind of talking about what's going on in the world of Diecast and what's on our minds with that. But before we get to that, I want to make sure we thank our executive producer level patrons. That would be Video Geek Productions, First and 64th Customs, Twice Diecast, of course, and MrDriverDreams.org. Thank you, Mark, David, and everyone else who makes the show go. Mm-hmm. If you want to know more about how you can help support the show, you can visit DieCastBreakdown.com or click the little join button down below. You get access to some extra stuff. And we thank you very much. When you come on board and there's a bunch of other cool stuff that we're working on getting to our members, but more on that in a little bit. First, I want to introduce my amazing co-host, Mr. David Johns. David, how are you doing today? Doing good, Chuck. No place I'd rather be. Fantastic. I couldn't agree more. And I am very, very excited to introduce our guest co-host, Pia, also known as Mad Visions. Welcome, Pia. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you. And thank you guys for having me on the show. I know it's been like a year in the makings. I've yeah. been kind of dodging it, but <laughs> yeah, we here, finally guys. got you to come <laughs> on. We've had you saying you're watching Diecast Breakdown on our show for a long time now, and now you actually are on the show. So for anyone who has been living under a rock and doesn't know what Mad Visions is, uh, tell us a little bit about you and uh, your Diecast obsession. Well, my Diecast obsession started off with the Nissan Silvia S15. I mean, we've all, all of us who collect Diecast, we've all played with it when we were kids and stuff and once you grow up you kind of grow out of it but then you think about you you want to get back into what you had when you were a kid Mm -hmm. and then at that time it was mainly fantasy and for that time was also a lot of muscle cars and then that's when the s15 when i saw the s15 i think i want i want to say it was in like the street tuner set or something it's the white sylvia s15 i'm like wow they make that and that's what brought me back into Hot Wheels and into diecast in general. And then I got into hunting, finding mm-hmm. things on the pegs and then finding all these JDM cars. Because for me, it's JDM. Mm-hmm. And then actually through diecast and Hot Wheels and all that stuff, it actually brought me closer to muscle cars. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of castings I didn't know of until Hot Wheels. Mm-hmm. Or a lot of cars, I should say. I didn't know until Hot Wheels and also Matchbox. But yeah, and then that's what got me to start channel was actually watching Derek on his diecast mm-hmm. and he's always pushing people to start channels and stuff and I'm like all right well I'll start a channel and at that time I was doing wood burning and that's why I started it I mean if you watch any of the old videos you'll see some of the wood burning on there and stuff too so I'm like I'm gonna do wood burning burning and diecast and I learned pretty quickly that that doesn't work <laughs> you got to be yeah. on one specific topic, and then that's when I just switched to diecast. And funny thing, actually, before I even started the channel, my very first subscriber was Mark. I'm like, oh, this creeper here. following me. But yeah, it was Mark. <laughs> he was my very first subscriber. But huh? yeah, and the name Mad Visions originated yeah. from my daughter's name, actually. Her name is Madison, and our neighbor used to call her Mads. <sighs> So that's why I use MAD as the very first part of it. And uh, when I started, I wanted to get into customs and stuff. So I wanted everything to be in my vision. So Mm -hmm. I combined the two to MAD visions. I love it. Nice. Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, very cool. And so for those who have followed Pia, he's been a really strong member of the diecast youtube community for sure and has participated in a lot of awesome stuff and i know you're taking some time out now because you got a new addition to the mad visions family and we're glad that we were able to to get you on and keep you in the the public eye a little bit as we're we're unleashing this new well it's not really new we're we're kind of taking 
our old format and we're breaking it up a little bit. And basically, when we started this show, we wanted to do news, a topic, and an interview in one episode. And it turns out that that ends up with a very long episode because we ended up getting these interviews. And I thought the interviews would last maybe 10, 15 minutes. And they go a solid hour just about every time because we've got interesting people on the show. What can I say? But so what we're going to do to break things up a little bit is we are going to start doing a news roundup where we talk about what's exciting us in the world of diecast to keep things active and current and give us something to, to discuss. And there's a whole lot going on in the world of diecast. And I want to turn it over to our guest first. So Pia, tell me what's exciting you in the world of diecast. Well, the red line club itself has been on fire. Right? Um, so first we're going to talk about the, membership car it is the volkswagen beetle it's the exact same one as the cowabunga so Mm -hmm. you got the blue release and the pink release the pink was Mm -hmm. the uh selections car yep but uh, this one won't have the roof rack Mm -hmm. and this one will be carted Mm -hmm. i don't know if the trunk will open but i assume it will open Mm -hmm. but i mean it's a carded one so most people well not most i guess some people will keep it you know won't they will open it up and stuff but this one will come in a green spectra flame and I am definitely going to be getting this one because I love the color bug. It's, it's a beautiful so what, car. Yeah. Go oh, ahead, yeah. David. Yeah, Pia, tell us what all appeals to you. I, I'm curious. I want, to, I want to hear this from Chuck because this is one of those that's going to cross over with a lot of people. We got VW diehards. We got uh, mm-hmm. custom vehicle fans. We got California cruiser fans as well. So, Pia... What do you like about this one? Well, for me, it was Herbie. Herbie, oh, yeah. I love the Uh-oh. movie Herbie. <laughs> Don't get now me started, you're, now man. You're talking Chuck's <laughs> language. Yeah. And I've always been a fan of rat rods and stuff, and Volkswagen Beetle is one of the iconic cars for rat rods and stuff, the rust builds. And uh, yeah, that's that's how I got into or well, the love of Volkswagens. Okay. Yep, that yep. Yeah. There he is. Yep. So this you, one actually, this not- is... This one is a Hot Wheels, by the way. This is from their Elite oh, series when they did – it's a 143rd scale. They did a 118th scale and a 143rd scale Herbie in both the Love Bug and the Monte Carlo format. And this is the Monte Carlo version, which is my favorite version because it's got the spotlight and the cool gas cap on mm-hmm. that side. Anyway. But, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I agree. I I love the Kawabuga too. I got the blue version. When it came out, I passed on the pink one because I was like, okay, I've already got this car and I'm, I might customize it someday just to, to make everyone lose their mind. <laughs> but because I've, I, I always tell myself I, I won't buy any car that I'm not willing to drill. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool casting. As far as Hot Wheels VWs go, besides this one in the 118th scale, Herbie, this one's about as good as it gets. It's a very nice casting, very well done. I love the the subtle flair to the the fenders. It's it's a little bit modified. It's got that opening trunk, which is super cool. I, I'm kind of bummed it doesn't have the roof rack because I love the roof rack on it. But me it too. reminds me, my dad actually had a, a green VW Bug, very similar to this one, that was, had big wide tires on the back and big speakers, and he had put fake stained glass windows in the back to like this film that made the back windows look like stained glass. In the 70s, white pinstriping it was really quite the machine. Wow. And my family grew up with Volkswagens. So I like I like Herbie. I like VWs because we owned a bunch of them. But I I, I don't my, – my, my membership just lapsed a few months ago, and I don't know if I'm going to bring it back. We'll be back with more Diecast Breakdown after this word from our sponsors. Legendary Hollywood concept artist and designer Fireball Tim Lawrence has created three exclusive pieces of automotive art based on the three hosts of Diecast Breakdown. Get these and other brilliant designs printed on mugs and more at FireballTimGarage.art today. Diecast Breakdown would like to thank Diecast Heroes Magazine for supporting this program. Diecast Heroes Magazine is the premier digital and print resource just for Diecast customizers. Visit DiecastHeroes.com and see what the best customizers in the world are up to. Here's this week's small channel shout out. Spork Syndicate. 
If you have a favorite diecast channel with less than 700 subscribers and you'd like to see them highlighted on a future episode, email us at diecastbreakdown at gmail.com. And now back to Diecast Breakdown. I really don't. Let's, I think let's you talk should. about that, guys. Let's talk about it should. and why you should and and who wants to kick off the conversation on what they're doing different with overdrive. overdrive. I've already said my okay. piece. You can find my short on it. If you want, it's on this channel. <laughs> and I, I had some, some interesting thoughts on it, but I'll let Pia go first. Yeah. Lay it out, know. lay it out for us. Pia. What is, what is Redline club overdrive? So overdrive is, it's an extension to your membership. It costs 90 or a hundred dollars basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're guaranteed to get every release. If you choose does not, that, does that 99 include every car? Or you still got to pay for the cars. Just well, you to gotta clarify. pay for the cars. You gotta pay for the cars, okay. but it guarantees you a spot to get the car. And <laughs> I want to say, if I remember right, they people who are the Overdrive members get early dibs on it, and then they have like mm-hmm. ten day period to cancel it. Right. Mm-hmm. You get a right of and, first refusal. Yep. So I mean, it's cool, but it there's. They didn't solve the problem of bots. The bots are okay. going to be an issue. So they just put a Band-Aid on it, in my opinion. But, I mean, for people who like the releases and stuff, yeah, I think it's a great deal. But, like, not everybody's going to like, like every release that comes out. Because, I mean, right. every release is to different different sections of the car world. So, I mean, you mm-hmm. got your JDMs, your Muscles, yep. even the Lowrider. Yep. The Lowrider is pretty big this year, too, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just to just to lay it out for folks, like if I'm a Overdrive Club member, and I want you guys to correct me if I'm wrong, because we're, we're going to have a lot of viewers that are going to need to know this information. You sign up for it. Mm-hmm. If you aren't on it and you aren't watching your account, you're gonna, you're going to get these cars in the mail every one to three weeks. It's going to be plenty, and mm-hmm. you're going to get hit twenty five bucks, thirty bucks a pop every mm-hmm. time, plus tax and shipping. Uh, Plus tax and shipping, and to Pia's point, I'm not, I'm not gonna want every RLC that comes out mm-hmm. now for a reseller. I'm sure they will. So, on the let me let me pose it this way because I know that you two both have great points. If I say to you guys, why is this not solving the problem of? resellers getting their bots and getting their five or 10 and, and leaving everybody else out in the, in the lurch. So Chuck, why is this potentially not going to solve that problem? Well, uh, I, I talk about this a little bit in the short, but you know, you only have 60 seconds in the short to get your point across. And it took me like five tries to get it into a minute, but basically the way this is set up at first, it sounds really good because you pay a hundred bucks you get your spot in line and you're guaranteed this car. And I thought initially, okay, great. This is going to be something that everybody can do. It's, it stinks that this is how it has to be, that we can't just say, okay, we're going to do this Kickstarter style where everybody who wants to buy this car, we do the pre-orders like they do every now and then. And everybody who wants to get one, will get one. Now, I get why they don't do that because there are people that like the rarity of their cars. And if you do that, then it's not rare because then you got 50, 60,000 people buying the car. So they want to keep it small. They're usually 25, 30,000 cars. So I was like, okay, well that makes sense. So then you can, you can pay a little extra and you get your, your spot in line. But then I found out that it's limited to only 10,000 people. And there was a lot of confusion over this because there were a lot of people saying, oh, well, it's not limited to 10,000 people. There's people saying it was. There was a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion. There was some glitch on the website at some point when somebody went to sign up for the Overdrive membership. It said that it would be charging him $99 a month. Mm. And obviously that would be a terrible deal. But... It, it, with it being limited to 10,000 people and then they haven't said this, but I've got to assume that that 10,000 is going to then take a chunk out of that 30,000 cars that are normally available. So that run. means that now yeah, run. there's only 20,000 available for something that was selling out in seconds week after week. And yep. 
it basically is incentivizing people who buy all the cars, which would be resellers. And uh, well, here's the other weird thing. It was only through April through the end of the year. It's not even a year membership. It's eight month membership. And at one to three cars a week, it shakes out to about 20 cars in the remainder of the year. So you're looking at an extra five bucks a car. Okay, that's not that big a deal if you're buying all of them. And if any of you have ever bought from a reseller an RLC car that you missed out on, you know that that can very quickly pay for itself if you miss something that you really, really wanted and you're willing to pay 200 bucks for one car later. But then the theory that I had, which it might actually not be playing out, which I'm kind of pleased that it isn't, but my thought was that all the people with the bots and all the people with reselling intentions, even people who sell cars and own diecast stores, why wouldn't you sign up for that? Because then you're guaranteed a car. It's taking an additional spot in line. So you've got that car reserved. So that depletes the the aftermarket amount available still. So that makes the value go higher. Because now there's only 20,000 cars for other people to fight over. And at five extra bucks a car, you can easily make that up on the secondhand market. So initially I thought it would lower the demand for the resale because... Basically, everybody could sign up for one. And if you bought five or six cars, well, it would easily pay for itself. And you don't have to deal with the headache of the bots and all the automation. But it's not just limited to 10,000. They're stopping this. We're recording on Monday, March 18th. They're saying it ends tomorrow. They're going to close Overdrive Club, whether they hit the 10,000 limit or not. So that might actually not be a bad thing because there certainly are less than 10,000 being sold. The fact that mm -hmm. it's still available at all is is surprising to me because I figured stuff in the Hot Wheels community, it goes fast. David and I, when we're trying yep. to sign up for the Hot Wheels collector show, sold out almost instantaneously. The Three tickets minutes. for the extra yep. event stuff sold out instantaneously. The hotel sold out instantaneously. RLC cars sell out instantaneously. So I was shocked that this is the, the De Tomaso Mangusta situation again where the the yeah. car just kind of sat there which i don't know why but i i like the mangusta i mean i get yeah, that people don't like the doors on the back because they're really there's a huge gap in them but i thought it was a cool looking design but you know it it, it may actually be a flop i'm i'm very curious to see how this plays out but again i love hot wheels i love mattel i'm just i'm really surprised at the rollout that there was this many glitches misinformation the fine print was definitely different on the site than it was in the emails there was a lot of of misinformation but ultimately it i think will be a good thing for the people who want to buy a lot of cars if you want to buy one or two so much for that yeah that's that's definitely not worth it but there there are a few cars coming out. We've seen some photos leaked on Reddit, and you're probably seeing them over my face right now while I'm talking, of some of the cars that are coming to the RLC Club very soon. And the, that lowrider Datsun 720 pickup looks really cool. There's the 92 GMC Typhoon. That looks really cool. Skyline's coming back. The RX-7 looks really good. The other thing, too, there's there's not a lot of clarity on this, but the other cars, like the other RLC exclusives, like this seems like it's just for the cars. It's not for the packs. It's not for the big factory sealed case. It's not for the elite stuff. It's just the RLC cars. And I think that also perturbed a few people because it feels like if you're going to pay that much for basically just holding a spot in line, then it feels like you should be able to get everything that comes from the Mattel collections drop or at least yeah, sign like up for a it. VIP backdoor pass. Yeah. So Back, backstage pass. And, and I'm, I'm sure I, anybody who was around in the eighties and nineties and remembers the Columbia record club memberships <laughs> where you had to make sure Coil you opted pin. out or they'd send you CDs that you definitely did not want knows the, the dangers of signing up for something that automatically opts you in. And again, I, I struggle with the fact that Hot Wheels basically, when they did this, wrote themselves a check for a million dollars if it had sold out because there were 10,000 memberships times 100. That's a million bucks. So I'm sure they thought it was a great idea to add a little bit of code to their site and make a million dollars. 
And on one hand, yes, they're they're taking the money that the resellers would be getting anyway. But at the same time, it also, like Pia said, I don't think it solves the bot problem. So I think time will tell, but I'm, I'm not rushing out to get one at the last minute. I, I, I might sign back up for it for a few cars, but the, the thing for me that, and I know I've been talking for like 25 minutes here is <laughs> the, the opportunity cost. Like we, we all are collectors with, some of us have budgets, some of them are stricter than others. And you have to think sometimes, what do I want to spend my $25 on? Do I want to spend it on this arguably very cool and beautiful Hot Wheels car? Or do I want to spend it on a incredibly detailed Tarmac Works car or an NO64 or a Mini GT that looks like I'm holding a small car in my hand? It's it, it, it's a tough one because it ain't the same without the flame. But at the same time, that market of premium diecast rather is just getting better and better each day. It seems mm-hmm. with new releases. Yeah, exactly. Level, level on the up. rise. Exactly. Honestly, Chuck broke it down pretty well. I can see a positive on the ninety nine bucks. Like, if you are wanting a specific car, like you want the chameleon skyline that's gonna be coming out the r34 or you want the mm-hmm. supra and rx7 and you want to guarantee yourself that car so you buy the 99 dollars and then you get the other cars sell it back make your money back and mm. then that way you're guaranteed option. to get the three four cars that you wanted that year but i mean other uh-huh. than that like i said there's still that bot issue like all right you guys for the average people like me and stuff david i think you do rlc still Right? From time to time. Yeah. So, like, mm-hmm. if there's a car that you want that's, for the most part, pretty popular, you're still going to be fighting the bots. Now, yeah, I will true. say, I will say the Skyline, the Advanced Skyline that just came out, mm-hmm. the checkout went pretty smooth. I think they okay. redid the, the CAPTCHA thing a little bit. So, mm-hmm. like, the car, it's a Skyline, it's Advanced, so you would expect it to sell out within five minutes. Crazy. Yeah. And I think it lasted quite a while. So maybe they yeah. might have figured out the bite issue, but that was mm. – I, I can't remember if that was before – that was before the Overdrive was released, I think, because the Overdrive was yeah. towards the end of the week. And I think you bring up an interesting point, too, and that is you can always just resell the cars that you don't want and have it pay mm-hmm. for itself. And yeah. I don't know if I can look Derek in the face if I do that, but because he's <laughs> going to be like, Chuck, are you making not, it all about the cars about the or are you making do it, it all about the Don't money? do it. Yeah. But, you know, that's the game. It's, and I think this is another discussion topic that I think is worth talking about is I had somebody on one of the Facebook groups was asking what advice you would have for a, someone new to the hobby. And I said, there are two ways you can go about this. If you're looking at strictly collecting, you can look at it as being a collector or you can look at it as being an investor. And everybody out there is going, you ask Mike Zarnock or you ask Bruce Pascal, you ask all these guys for advice. They're always going to say, buy the cars that you like. And that's a nice thing to have etched onto a plaque on your wall. But at the same time, a lot of people buy them as investments. And there was just this story in the news about this guy that had his entire collection of like 8,000 plus cars destroyed Mm -hmm. in a flood and he's going well that was my child's college education which okay first of all your citation needed on that one second of all if you're looking at these as investments you can absolutely do that i uh I, i did the math and if you bought a brand new hot wheels car in 1968 and you had it now it would be worth way more money than if you had taken that same amount of money and put it in a high yield savings account so it did appreciate in value more than actually investing in a bank would do. Now, you also then have to deal with storing and maintaining and insuring your investment as well. And David, for those who don't know, works in insurance. And that's going to be another dis- discussion for another episode. We're going to be talking about protecting your investment if you choose to do it that way. But that's the, I, I feel like you can't do both. 
or at least you, if you do both, you have to be ready to take the flack from the other group of people. Yeah. So you show up in a collector group and you talk about how valuable your collection is. You're going to get all the honest diecasts of the world saying, well, it's not about the money. It's about the cars. And then if you go vice versa and you come in and you're like, Hey, check out my RLCs that I opened and I've got on display. And I, I got my super treasure hunt racing in the tiny track cars race. Isn't that cool? Well, the investors are all going to lose their mind and call you names and stuff too. And, and you gotta have a thick skin on some of those Facebook groups. People can get pretty oh, mean. Definitely. <laughs> it's funny because it's such a nice hobby until you get on the Facebook groups and everybody is just like, Whoa. <laughs> Oh, once you got Reddit, well, if you, Reddit's yeah. just as bad, if not worse. Yeah, oh, yeah. Know, ri- riding, riding a fence is painful, guys. If you just imagine it, <laughs> it's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> if, and again, I think there's nothing wrong with either. If you want to be an investor, be an investor, own yeah. it. Say that you're in it because you're buying these cars because they're going to be worth money and you can resell them. Or you can be a collector and you can just buy the cars that you like and open them or do whatever you want with them. But, you know, it's it's something that you have to make peace with what your collection is going to be about. And it's going to be very hard for you to, if you do either or. And another piece of advice that people were saying was, is you can never have enough. And that is absolutely not true. I am I am mm. actually looking at doing a David Johns and thinning my herd a little bit at this coming event. You can have event. enough because so. once you run out of space, that's the end of oh, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Exactly. That's all you get. Well, it's like... how. How how long are you going to really be enjoying your cars if they're just sitting in storage bins? They're not they're mm-hmm, not on yeah. display. They're they're stashed away somewhere. People are sometimes paying for storage units to to store their cars, so they're actually losing money on their their collection because they got nowhere to put it. So anyway, that's that's I think plenty of talk on the RLC club. We're going to take a quick break, yep. and when we come back, we're going to have some more news. So stick around. Don't touch the dial. Diecast Breakdown will be right back after these messages. Diecast Breakdown is produced in partnership with Twice Diecast and Driven Dreams Org on YouTube. Check out their channels in the video description and subscribe for more epic Diecast content. Hey, this is Larry Wood. Hey, this is Derek from Honest Diecast. Hey, this is Chad Reed from Round 2. Hey, this is Mike from Gas Labs. The SRT Joe Vita Show. This is Champion DJ K. Hey, this is Mad Vision here. This is Diecast Dude. And you're watching Diecast Breakdown. And now, the thrilling conclusion of this week's episode of Diecast Breakdown. Well, we are back and we are talking about what's exciting us in the world of Diecast for spring of 2024. Pia, I know you had some other stuff on your mind. Let's talk about what you're excited about in the world of Diecast. Yeah. One last piece. I know we talk, we said we were going to be done with RLC, but this is, I mean, I don't know, technically RLC, but this is the Elite 6.4. It's going to be the Pandem Dotson 280ZX. That comes mm-hmm. out Thursday, so it should already came out by the time this, this uh, video comes out. But this mm. is, I mean, the Elite 64, they're, they've been doing some pretty good stuff with there. And it's $20. It's $5 cheaper than yeah. your typical carded RLC. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, some people can make an argument that it's actually a little more detailed than RLC. If you well, look yeah, at this one, lens. Yeah, 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 yeah I'll one. make that argument. I'll make that argument <laughs> all day, Pia. Like, the fact that these are all going to be true 164 and they're going to be consistent in your collection. Mm-hmm. I do think you get a lot more detail. It, it's not, we don't have uh, mismatched wheel sizes. I, I really prefer if I'm going to go any special order or special high end premium hot wheels, elite 164 is probably going to be what I would do. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the coolest thing about this, I mean, it's got the deep dish six spoke gold wheels with uh chrome, chrome lips. The intercooler, if you guys, well, if you look at the picture, the intercooler is very detailed. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's got the cooling fins yep. in there. And then the yep. best part, mm-hmm. this is a drift car. So if you look at the rear angle, you'll see that the wheels are cambered out already. So for oh, people really? who like wow, cambered stance, this is it right here. Yeah. Chuck, these keep getting better and better. That Toyota Chaser did not knock the, the not. doors off of everybody when it came out. But I'll tell you this. It, and I'm going to defend it for just a second because I was I was a huge hater of that car when it came out. When you get it in your hand and look at it actually out of the blister, 
It's not. It's not the worst looking car. I mean, it is what it is. Oh, that is it, a it's ringing it, endorsement from David Johns. <laughs> it, it's it's what it looked like, and these things are getting better. I am hopeful that Elite sixty four could find their way onto one of my shelves in the future. Uh, not yet. The mock the Mustang didn't didn't do it for me either. Hold on. Mm-hmm. What you got? Hold Pia? on. I mean, the best release they have so far is by far. Oh, by far. This one right here, the Liberty, yeah, the Liberty Walk Lamborghini Ventador. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks good. It looks good. Hold on, hold on. Oh, are we? We're we, opening we, it live right here. Live, we're cracking. Live, live cracking. Opening. I mean, this right here. I mean, the back part of it comes off. The bumper comes off. Let's mm-hmm. see if I can figure this out. Okay, mm-hmm. the bumper comes off. The back window, I think, comes off too. Yep. So you can you customize got, it. Well, not just that, but you got the opening to see the twin turbo and the engine and everything. And the oh, wheels are cool. amazing. I mean, this is, I want to say, this is on par with Mini GT, if not better than Mini GT. Really? Yeah, well, this specific one. Oh, I yeah, mean, the Mini GT doesn't open like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Who this, was it? Was it? This is it. Was it Stance Hunter that did the Liberty Walk F40 that uh, has the yeah. liftoff Stance, back? Yeah, that, one, Hunter, that one's really good, uh, too. That's this one right here. Now this one is highly detailed. This this one right here where the back yeah that one pops yeah. off yeah yeah. But I mean they are. I saw the detailed. goods. I saw that one in the uh, secret diecast store that I found in Kissimmee, and I was I was very tempted by that one. But uh, yeah, I mean I I will say I really like the 280 from what I've seen the elite version of the 280, mm. and I'm mm-hmm. kind of the flip flop of Pia in that I came to cars from more of the muscle car and Volkswagen side and then got into JDM because I just, well, first of all, I operated under a very silly impression as a kid that all of the JDM cars were front wheel drive. And, (laughs) and of course that's incredibly wrong. And then I realized how good looking so many of those seventies and eighties JDM cars were. And and of course the nineties cars and the, the Supra, of Mark IV and the 300ZX of the 90s. I, the 300ZX of the 90s, I still think, is one of the most beautiful cars ever made. It, it's timeless. Like It looks like something that could be made today. Yeah, and, there's a reason why uh, they took the headlights off the 300ZX and put it... And put it on the Diablo. You know, like, yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I like know it. that All one. right. And okay, so, so we're getting but, some... You know, so I will say I am very excited about this 280... Until I scroll down and see the rest of the cars in our news, <laughs> and I go, "Oh, well, there's there's other stuff," and we'll we'll get to that in a little bit, because yeah, you picked out some some other really cool looking Liberty Walk themed cars. Yeah, they're the Eno sixty four RX seven that's going to be coming out. Now, mm-hmm. initially, when I saw this, I thought that there was another Porsche nine three five because from the front end it looks it like looks Porsche like 9... one. Yeah, yeah. Sure does. And so you see the rear, and you're like, "Oh, that's an RX-7 with the the Liberty Walk kit on it and stuff." Mm-hmm, but it's actually mm-hmm. it's very cool. They got one in black. That's Coca-Cola, mm-hmm. and then the other one is Felipe. Felipe. I don't know that one. Oh, shells, I guess. But yeah, sure. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the black one. The black one's nice. I mean, yeah, black cars, black race car always looks really nice. But yeah, I'm I'm yeah. excited for that one right there and. If anybody, I mean, if anybody buys premium brands and stuff, everybody knows that they knock it out of the ballpark with everything that they make. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I don't, I don't have any Inos in my collection yet, but I, I really want to get one, and that's why I'm looking at it and going, okay, do I sign up for the Overdrive Club or do I buy some Inos and some Mini GTs and and you know maybe I can do both because I haven't really thought about the resale side of things, but yeah, that's uh. Those are those are some very very good looking cars, and I did the same thing you did. I mean, because that that body kit on the the RX seven between the the shell livery and the front yeah. vents and the hood louvers, the front screams nine thirty five, but it's mm-hmm. uh, you know a very cool take on a very cool vehicle. So uh, yep. I'm yep, excited yep. about that as well. Well, I am excited about well. It, it 
it's already happened. And I think this is another thing that people are sleeping on that they shouldn't be. The other car companies, we've talked about Tarmac Works has their car club. Hot Wheels, of course, has the RLC. But a lot of people don't know that M2 has a car club called the Auto Club. I think it's called the Auto Club Box or something. And they just released this beautiful 87 Buick Grand National Custom. And uh, it's too late to get it now, but I wanted to show it anyway because it it looks way better than most M2s look. It, it, it's a very mm-hmm. cool looking car. And I know a lot of people have concerns about quality control at M2. I get that. I feel like M2 is getting a raw deal in whoever's shipping their stuff to Walmart. And that's where the quality control issue is coming in, because I feel like these cars are just getting knocked around. Oh, yeah, the boxes but, are destroyed sometimes. Yeah, because the boxes are often destroyed. And, and two, these cars are where are M2s always placed. They're on that low shelf. They've got the ones on the pegs, but they're on that low shelf that's right at four- or five-year-old height. And they're in little boxes that fit perfectly in a five-year-old's hand. Ask me how I know. And, and kids will pick them up and throw them around and they'll get knocked around and the parts get knocked off of them. And frequently, every time I see one missing parts, the parts are in there. They've just gotten knocked off the car. And I'm inclined to think that that's because they were damaged in transit rather than they were poorly made at the factory. I mean, that could be an issue too. But at the same time, we're talking about lens headlamp cars that are I think true 164. They're pretty darn close. I think close. they are. They they seem like they're you look at their 59 Cadillac and it looks like a 164 like it's it's huge compared to other stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're talking opening parts, lens headlamps. I know opening parts is kind of a a sticky issue with people and I I am starting to come around to the sealed look as a customizer. I like ones that have opening doors and stuff for removing and doing junk cars and gas land stuff. But the sealed look is a lot cleaner and you get better scale lines. But I, I still think for the money, if you're willing to look at them closely before you buy them, they're very, very good cars. And I'm looking forward to having M2 on the show someday. Um, so we're yep, hoping they come absolutely. on soon. M2, so, we know uh, you're watching. We know you're watching. All right. Pia, what else you got? Let's see. Well, we do have the new Fast and Furious set that's going to be coming out soon. Not mm-hmm. sure what the actual release date is, but it's an up-and-coming set. Now, this this is going to have the Porsche 911 Carrera RS 3.8. That's a new casting for the Fast mm-hmm. and Furious line. A uh, Toyota Land Cruiser for uh, FJ43. That's a new one as well because the last one was an FJ60. Mm-hmm. And then the Mercedes Benz 500 SL that finally comes to the Fast and Furious line. And then the last two are just repeats: the Land Rover Defender 90 and the Custom Integra GSR. Which funny thing about that, it's exact same card art as as the original wow. the first one. Like they didn't even do anything. <laughs> think, and it's funny because one of five. It's the, it's the one of five for that set too, but yeah, they didn't do anything well, they did, different. They, they changed the logo color. Yeah, they did. They yeah, changed the logo color <laughs> and they moved that to the yeah. bottom. But yeah, yeah, I mean, other than that, they didn't do anything different with the GSR. So Pia, which one of these is the chase? Well, oh, the, bla- the Land Rover is black, all black. So that would technically be the chase, right? Yeah, all chases are black. Exactly. Uh, no, no, definitely the but, chase uh, on this one will be the Porsche 911 Carrera. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's, gonna second, that's gonna be the hard to find one for sure. Yeah, and the close but, second uh, will probably be the Mercedes Benz, just because that's been such a popular casting. I, mm-hmm. I gotta yeah, say, I, I dig that Mercedes. I think that's mm-hmm. a really good looking casting. The Porsche 911 Carrera. I know, I know, Honest Diecast is gonna be all over that. All one. over it. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and it's Fast and Furious, and yeah, I I get that there's uh Fast and Furious fatigue, and that the fatigue is real, yeah. but Hey, it's still getting us some really cool castings out there. And the Integra, it's an older casting, but it is a very good casting. And we haven't had it out in a little while. So it's nice to have that one back in rotation. I don't even think I have. The, well, I mean, they put the Fast and Furious out and every time they put it out, it sells out. So, I mean, us as consumers yeah. are still buying it, even though a lot of us are tired yep. of it. It's still being bought, still being sold. I mean, it's 
it's such a good synergy too because they've done they put so many cars in that movie and it's so oh, yeah. easy to just okay well they got one of these yeah. we can pull this one off the shelf they got a my favorite so far has been the the land cruiser that the rock is driving and it's in like one scene for five seconds. And they're like, yes, no, it's in the fast and furious line. And it's like, yep. all right, fine. Yeah. Well, like so the, the last of the 86 Truno, that one had a screen right. time of like, it was in the Tokyo drift, but it had a screen time of like millisecond. The car would literally went yeah. around it and then it got made into a hot wheels. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. Uh, so parents of small children rejoice because if you know what posh peanut is, which I did not, it's a baby clothes line and line of there's actually loungewear and stuff for parents too. And they've got a hot wheels tie in featuring retro hot wheels designs. And you're seeing some of those and that's pretty cool looking. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I would not be ashamed to have my uh, little boy walking around in some of those. It's just a, another interesting tie in with our, our friends with the flame. And uh, speaking of our friends with the flame, it looks like some of that flame is getting put under glass. There's a photo out on Facebook. She and Nito posted this. And it is a photo of a Hot Wheels display case that is behind locked glass. And I think it's kind of a, a sign of the times that people have been abusing the big box stores for a long time. And so they're looking for solutions, just like we're looking for solutions to the bots. We're looking for solutions to the shop lifters and the pallet raiders. And I'm I'm still surprised that pallet rating hasn't been quashed. I mean, I get that Walmart is a big store and it's impossible to keep an eye on all your employees, but it, it's just kind of gotten so out of hand with, with people buying them up. Apparently some places now the limitation, one person claimed that the Walmart employee watched him take it and would not let him take more than one of the same car. Now, first of all, I can't imagine anyone working at Walmart caring enough about it to actually enforce <laughs> right. it. Their job is hard enough as it is before having to argue with a die cast hoarder over how many gold Honda Civics they can take. But I don't know. What are what are your guys' thoughts on that? I'll go first. I, I don't honestly well maybe I don't even have a vote in this because I, it, it is very rare for me to buy main lines and, and I feel for you guys that are out there grinding looking for stuff and you can't find it but at the end of the day target is not going to take that hit over and over and over it's somebody at walmart you get high enough they're going to care when stuff is walking out the door in mm -hmm. people's pockets so you know this is kind of like a, we made our own bed we're going to have to lay in it folks and if you want to do your part and and try and change that culture with whatever you can do on your end then more power to you, and we should do that. It, I, I hate to say it is what it is, but we kind of did this to ourselves. And and this is us saying, hey, we're part of this community, the good and the bad. So, yeah, some clowns in our community have gotten us to the point where our stuff appears to look more valuable or, or as valuable as iPads and Michael Kors purses that are locked up <laughs> behind glass at stores, which is, I don't know. Yeah. Is that a, is that a compliment to our, our, our stuff that we collect? Is it really that valuable or do we just have some really ratchet collectors out there making us look bad? I think we all know the answer. That's my thoughts. David's busting out the Gen Z <laughs> talk. Everybody watch well, out. For me, I think probably the reason why they put the glass case there was one, number one is that, but I think the biggest thing is having to clean it, clean it up because we know mm -hmm. how yeah, that's you, a good throw, point. you throw four cases up there. You got three cases on the peg and then one case in the bin. Well, that's going to fill everything up. Well, guess what the, guess what the new guy is going to do or the, the scalper is going to do? Well, they're going to dig through that, try to find what they mm -hmm. want. And if they don't have a care for, for the other people's work, I guess, the things that they have to do to clean yeah. up after, which they shouldn't have to because they're not the, they're not their mom. They're not their dad. But they don't have the decency to clean up after themselves. And after that happening over and over again, I could see them wanting to be like, all right, well, we're just going to put this behind glass. And if you guys want to look for it or if you guys want to look through that, you got to get one of us. 
and then we'll just have to sit there and supervise you guys to make sure you guys ain't making a mess, and then we're going to yeah. rock it back up. I'm just trying to imagine having to sheepishly walk over to <laughs> some Walmart employee that's just trying to do their job and get through their day, right. and they've probably got their earphones in while they're stocking the shelf, and I'm like, excuse me, I am a grown man in my 40s. I would like you to come with me Please. to the toy section and stand beside me while I look through row after row of tiny cars. And I don't know that like that kind of feel, maybe that'll put a damper on, on some of the, the action as well as like yeah. you're there. Cause there is, I, I think that you, there shouldn't be a stigma about being an adult who collects miniatures or toys. Life is hard. Find the things that make you happy and enjoy them. But there's still that stigma out there that there's people out there like, really, you, you still play with tiny cars or whatever. And, but I, 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 at the same time, I, I don't hate the idea that there's some kind of buffer that's slowing people down because it's so easy yeah. in those stores. So you got all the time people ripping the, the packages open and pocketing cars or partially disassembling a nine pack or a 20 pack. And I know, and of course we're not even getting into the people that buy the, the big sets and swap out mainline cars for the premiums, <laughs> Yeah, which I'm still oh, like, yeah. yeah, do you have that kind of time <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, to return it, do all that to return it, it box and, and return it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's funny. The first time I saw that, I thought somebody had done that in the store and had pocketed the cars. And I was like, no, dummy. They, they took it home and mm-hmm. then returned it. Because in my head, there's not a space for me. Because I'm like, well, that's a 15-minute drive each way. And then you have to take it all apart. You have to carefully put it back. And you have to take it in there and sell to this person. Of course, they don't care. And they don't know. They, the, the person at the customer service thing looks in there and goes, yeah, that, that seems right. I've seen yep. people have posted photos of like a large car that somebody just jammed yeah. there, like a, a cheap dollar tree car and returned it. And it's, it's a lot of apathy and it's a lot of greed combining and making a very ugly scene. But again, we can be better as a community. We can challenge each other to do better and maybe not look at this as a war to be won, but as an opportunity or challenge to overcome together. However, you figure out how to do that. I and mean, when you do, do yeah. figure that out, let me know. And speaking of main lines, I got a few more things before I turn things over to Mr. David Johns real quick. The G case has got the Dodge dart, which is one of my favorite castings coming back in a really cool Ram charger livery. That livery shows up every now and then it was a classic look from the mid 60s and really makes this dodge dart look good and another main line that's coming out that is actually a new casting is this pontiac aztec custom nate adams pointed out on facebook that if you look inside the pontiac aztec there's actually a little tiny pair of glasses and a little bowler or trilby whatever that hat is that walter white wore I'm breaking bad. Get out of here. drove a <laughs> green Pontiac Aztec. And those are the kind of Easter eggs I love about Hot Wheels cars. And I think that's a very funny little bit of, of yeah, I like it. hidden, hidden treasure that they've put in there. I'm still surprised. So, they even all right. Well, that is Aztec. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah I, no of all the, of all the cars, there's, there's folks out there. Well-meaning folks that, have simple asks, simple cars, very popular cars, cars like a 93 Saturn. Yeah. We're all <laughs> over all the we road want. And, all we and, want. and have a beloved following. They're getting passed over for the Pontiac Aztec. And so did you say Pontiac Aztec? And I'm saying, no, Plymouth Valiant. I heard a P sound. So Pontiac Aztec yeah. it is. Mm, so mm, yeah, mm. it's a, it's a curious choice for sure. I mean, I, think it's kind of fun it'll be a great gaslands vehicle but i am scratching my head on that but i do love that they they did a tie-in or at least a nod even though the vehicle is is very heavily modified and could it would be very difficult to make it look like a stock pontiac Aztec. i've got a few pieces of news from slightly outside of the diecast manufacturing universe many of you know rust belt customs as a decal provider for customizers in the community it makes a lot of Really nice decal sets, white toner decals, sells them at a very reasonable price, does custom decals 
for people, which I tried doing that for a hot minute and boy, do I not want to ever do that again. So he's doing some, some tough work out there, but he has released a Patreon where you can sign up and is at different tiers. You get sheets of decals sent to you every month. So it's kind of a subscription service yeah. that supports him. And at the same time you're getting, I think at $12, you get two sheets of decals a month. Uh, you get them kind of randomly. They're kind of surprise things and you can vote on future decal sets that he makes. So I think that's a, a really cool thing that you can check out. I'll uh, link to that in the show notes and our friends over at car wars. You may remember uh, Steve Jackson games. They were a guest on diecast breakdown previously, and they have announced that uh, coming a little later in 2024 is the new two player starter set. It's called the orange and purple set. Although I am told that the vehicles come unpainted so you can paint them to suit your needs that's a two-player starter set that is compatible with the larger car wars universe and missions but it's basically everything that you would need for a two-player game right out of the box and i believe the prices on this are going to be relatively affordable i think the price is around 30 35 bucks i'm not sure on that one but you can check out car wars and subscribe to their youtube channel or follow them on facebook for more information on that when it comes out and again thanks to them for being on the show and really like what they're doing i'm wishing them the best of luck as they continue to make more fun stuff for us to enjoy and customize our 164 scale cars into all right, Chuck, we are going to finish on a high note. Maybe lift your spirits. No Valiant in 24, I, I fear, my friend. But I'm going to do this in rapid fire format, guys. So we'll wrap up the episode. I've got a few things that I saw. First was this really cool Hot Wheels Boulevard series coming out. I typically find two to three cars, four on a great set. This is almost five great cars. Look at this. I'm going to go worst to first Fiat Skyline Lamborghini Toyota Supra. I love this Mitsubishi 3000 in green mm -hmm. guys. Give me really quickly your favorite out of that set. Don't even want to know why. Just tell me which one is your favorite Fiat Skyline Chuck's going Fiat. Yeah. That's yeah. the oldest no, one in no. the lot. <laughs> yeah. You guys are both you guys are both on brand with those choices. Yeah. Shout out to Mr. Lamley. He gives us a pick of the first look I've seen of the Mitsubishi mm -hmm. Eclipse that you guys saw here in prototype form first on Diecast Breakdown many, many mm -hmm. months ago. Great job by Chad Reed and the gang over at Round Two, aka Auto World. Mm -hmm. Love this Mitsubishi Eclipse in gold with the black roof. What do you guys think of that? Can't wait for the Eagle Talon version. <laughs> Always been <laughs> yeah, a fan of DSM, so true. I like it. I, I, I'm with you there. That absolutely one I am looking for. I wanted to highlight a couple auto or diecast makers that are doing things the right way for collectors in terms of social media. So this was just a regular post from Auto World Diecast. And if you guys aren't on Instagram, you guys need to follow your favorite diecast brands on Instagram. That's where we're getting a lot of this information and cool ones like auto world diecast shows you the mainline version. Here's your ultra red version. Here's your ultra raw version. So exactly what all the chase vehicles look like, just something that they don't have to do, but they do it. And, and I, I just, I appreciate it. So I wanted to give them mm -hmm. a little bit of kudos on that. Same with Maisto. I noticed on their social media, they have all of their products in an online catalog for you to surf and you don't have to wait for stuff to come out. You can see what's coming out and it's all right there for you. Eddie, Eddie over at Maisto, thank you for, I'm sure the input you gave them to get this catalog out for us. For real, we do appreciate it as collectors. Guys, do you guys ever go to the so social media for a specific diecast brand? Yeah, I do it for I do it for Mini GT and Auto World. Now, going off of what you're saying about the Auto World thing, I think if Hot mm -hmm. Wheels would have done that, they would have squashed so many arguments with those Chase number six. <laughs> On right. social media. I mean, there was, uh, it is a chase. It isn't a chase, yeah. but 
yeah, they would have squashed a bunch, uh, a bunch of conversations. Yeah, I think that's a, a real missed opportunity. That's a good point, Pia. And I will say that I think when it comes to managing social media, especially Instagram, nobody does it better than Tarmac Works. Felix is very good about getting out there and personally introducing each new car, giving you information on them, answering questions live. I think that they're the brand to look to when it comes to getting things right on social and showing that they're actively listening. Round two does a great job with the Chad Reed videos every month, outlining everything that's coming out as well. So props to them as well, but you know, you got to give it to Felix at Tarmac works for really kind of showing how it's done in uh, the modern age. And, and putting out cars that are a direct result of getting feedback from collectors. So, Always, always appreciated. I want Mm -hmm. to, we talked about something that Hot Wheels could do. And I wonder, guys, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. I wonder if they don't want to clarify that. Do they like that little air of mystery? And and if it's a chase, maybe it is. If you pay for it as as a chase, then yeah, it's a chase. Or if you you don't want it to be, then no, Mm -hmm. it's it's not. I don't know. Just my my little conspiracy theories. I was honestly surprised. I was honestly surprised they answered Jason's question at all when Mustang Hunter called them up. Yeah. I do like whoever put this in. It looks like it's 164 collectors put out what we know for Super Treasure Hunts coming out in 24. We we see 12 of them here. Again, I want to do this, maybe just get you guys to pick one that you're really looking forward to. I think we heard I might go with the old bandit. Pontiac Firebird. That's not the worst looking Firebird. I can't tell. I guess that that plastic piece, though the the window piece, is that yeah. where the T top is? I mean, did they not cut that out? No, nope, that's just window. I guess <laughs> it's just going to be yeah. a piece of plastic. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I I I like that treasure hunt because of the red, orange, yellow stripe on it. But mm-hmm. somebody pointed out to me how thick the top of the windshield is, <laughs> the windshield piece, as opposed to the actual windshield. Good and night. it yeah. kind of ruined that casting for me. <laughs> Boy, that is that's begging for a Dremel right there. Exactly. Get that out of there. All right, mm-hmm. Pia. I, I, I'm, I'm going to bet money that you are a Mix M or Mix K choice on your super treasure hunt for 24 which one is it? it's actually h no just kidding it's not h no it's definitely k <laughs> now i grew up on gran turismo and this car yeah. mm-hmm. with that specific livery was iconic on that game and in real life and that's why i think that in my opinion is one of the top ones for this year now we still don't know what np and q is, that- is yet but then like as for right now right a is my pick and is mm-hmm. that one known as a is that the Dorito car? Because it looks like there's the orange like patch, the patches <laughs> okay. on there or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last thing I had, guys, this is a pretty cool matchbox set. I like this Germany set. It's got a really, really good looking Porsche. It's got a retread on the orange wagon. I do like these matchbox sets that are by the country. Now, mm-hmm. sometimes there's some weird choices in there. That don't even match the country they're from. But mm-hmm. this is a pretty good looking set. What do you guys think about this one? I definitely dig it. That Porsche is really reminiscent to the, the main line for the Porsche 993 GT2 Super Treasure Hunt. Mm-hmm. Uh, same same mm-hmm. color scheme, purple. And the rest of it, I mean, I really don't really care f- don't really care too much for the rest of them. The BMW, if I did get that one, it would get chopped up and customized. But the Porsche is the winner out yep. of that set for me. I wonder if that golf has red. Hopefully, it's got red accents on the grill for that GTI. That would be cool. So. Yeah, I it's it's a fine set. The I've already got the castings that I like, which would be the the G, the Mercedes G, and the one twenty three wagon, which are both great castings, but they're they're not new. the mm-hmm. The GT three is a very good looking casting, but I, I'm. It's a little more modern than what I usually have in my collection. So I, I'm probably going to take a pass on this one. But oh. I, I, I do agree. I like these sets a lot. And I think they're good opportunities to bring out some some interesting castings. I just I wish I was seeing some more new stuff there. 
That has been our first news show. I hope you enjoyed it. Pia, thanks so much for uh, being with us. I really enjoyed having you on the show today. Yeah, once again, thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed my time here today. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, if you have ideas for a news piece that you'd like to see us feature on this show, you can email diecastbreakdown at gmail.com with your news tips. Or if you've got some cool event that's coming up, you're working on a custom contest or you're doing a race or you want to have some kind of announcement, we would love to shout those out on the show. So just make sure you email those to us with a few weeks advance notice so we can make sure that we get it out in a timely manner to people. So, all right, David, how are we doing? You feeling good about this new setup? Yes, but we can always do better. And that's not a reflection on this episode. I loved nope. what we talked about. We want to hear from you. We want feedback. How do, mm -hmm. how do we want to tweak this, guys? What do, what do you need for us to enhance your collection and your collecting? So let us know. Yep. This is a show by Diecast fans for Diecast fans. So we want to serve you as best we can. And again, thank you so much for making it to the end of another episode of Diecast Breakdown. Again, shout out to our patrons that make the show go. If you want to know how you can join their ranks, you can visit diecastbreakdown.com or click the little join button. And while you're down there, click all the little buttons down there that do things, especially the little thumb that points up. And leave a comment about your favorite bit of Diecast news or, like David said, a way that you think we could make the show better. And, as always, keep sharing the show, watch other videos, and thanks for coming along with us for the ride. So until next time, stay fresh, cheese bags. Thanks for listening to Diecast Breakdown. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend to listen in. Find Diecast Breakdown on your favorite social media platforms or visit DiecastMediaNetwork.com to learn more about this and our other projects. Diecast Breakdown is a presentation of Flying Valiant and the Diecast Media Network.